Okay, so hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Vogue Global. This is where we connect with global first entrepreneurs and remote work experts from all around the world. Our guest today is Patrick Kelly, uh, co founder and CEO at Signal Advisors. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Patrick, may maybe we, we can start with a brief intro. Can you tell us a few words about yourself? Sure. Um, I. Was born actually the global global podcast here. I was I was born overseas. I was born in Singapore, um, and then uh, when I was really young, like five years old, I moved. My, my parents made their way back to the states, so I'm I'm based out of Detroit. That's home. Um, I've lived here most of my life. I played lacrosse in college. I was always entrepreneurial. I would say I was always trying to figure out different ways to to start businesses and, and make some money and. You know, I think at a very young age, I realized that money was independence. And so it wasn't necessarily to get money. It was just to like, I even, I have two kids today and like, you know, watching them, they're always trying to figure out how to do stuff on their own. Like how to be more like, how, how do I become more adult like faster? <laughs> um, you know, and so like, I think for me, that was like money was definitely that. Um, like how, if I get access to money, then I can have more freedom and, and be more of an individual. And so that was always the attraction for me. And I think even to some degree that that still is, that still is kind of like a, a driver. Um, I, I went to, I played the cross in college, transferred, went, uh, graduated from Michigan State. Um, when I was at Michigan State, I got a, I got an internship at Northwestern Mutual. I will say probably for the first like 18 years of my life, maybe 19, 20 years of my life, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my professional life, like my career, I didn't really understand what direction I wanted to take it, but I knew I loved, like, I knew I just loved building things um, and being part of a team and building teams. And so um, I, I really just found my way into entrepreneurship. It wasn't something that I would say was kind of like a, a, a path that I plotted out for myself. I just, um, one thing led to the next. I, I had an internship at Northwestern Mutual I found a really specific niche. Um, Northwestern Mutual has a really high dropout rate and like it's a sales job, you know? And so financial advisors, they're certainly advisors, the best are, you know, but when you start out, you're selling, you know, because you're just trying to figure out how to make an income because it's all, it's all commission. And so um, in the very early days, um, I, I found a niche that I became really good at selling in, um, had a lot of success and was able to kind of make it to the next level. And you know, that was really the taking off point for me. So I know I, I went all the way back up to where I was born, um, but that's that's a little bit about me and my background and what shaped me. That's that's interesting how these early choices shape us, right? And speaking about your your transition, right, to, 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 to the internship, right? Uh, so speaking about that, uh, transitioning from a stable job to entrepreneurship, right? Is, is a kind of really sort of bold move, you know, for, uh, for, for me and for, for many guys, I guess, who experienced this, they, they know what, what, what I'm talking about. So what were the biggest fears, I guess, or challenges uh, that, that you faced at, 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 uh, at the start of your first company? I guess it was uh, RepPro, right? Yeah, RepPro. RepPro was a, an application automation platform. So, I mean, essentially there's a lot of, in the States, when you buy insurance, you got to fill out a lot of forms. We made that process a lot easier. Before RepPro came onto the scene, it was all paper-based and we digitized that and, and we put kind of, you know, an error correcting layer on top of it. So we made sure that when you submitted a form, it was submitted correctly. Um, and it was all done digital with e-signature, all kind of natively built inside of a plat our platform. And, and uh, there, there was, there's a lot more to it, but I mean, to go back to your question about like, how do you make this transition? I mean, for me, I was always on commission. So I always kind of felt like, Hey, it was eat, eat like eat what you kill kind of an environment. Um, but I, I generally think um, the risk, like, here's how I think about entrepreneurship in general is like, you only have to be right one time um, in order for you to have like really large outcomes. And so, but like you, the risk of failing is like your floor is zero. Your floor is not infinite, but your, your upside is infinite, um, hypothetically. And so I think like the risk of failing is your, is zero. Um, and so, and so because like, that's like the, the automatic reset, um, like you just have this ability to say like, okay, that thing didn't work. 
I I lost there. I lost temporarily. Um, but it's like it's like a season in football or like a, whatever, you know, whatever sport you're playing. And like you took a loss on one game, like get back up and go to the next one and, and try and win. And and so I think that um, people overplay the risks. I get it. Like there's lots of different situations out there. You know, there's people in different you know, debt situations or different family dynamics. So I'm not making light of it, how easy it is. I just, I think generally speaking, broadly, people I kind of like make the risks seem scarier than they are. I think once you're in it, it's like anything skydiving. If you ever skydive, I've, I've only been one time, um, but like before skydiving, it's the most terrifying thing in the world. When you're doing it, when you're in it, it actually becomes like this beautiful, awesome experience. And so like the anticipation, I think, is scarier than the actual thing. I think that's true with entrepreneurship also. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I completely agree with that. Um, and, you know, once you start the business, like uh, the first client is very like a huge milestone, right? Securing the, your first major client is a huge milestone. Can you maybe share the story of lending your your first significant client with Repro and maybe with your existing co uh, company? Because I remember my first clients for every business that I launched and with some of them, I still work, you know? What about you? Yeah, for my first client, uh, you know, when for Repro, it was interesting because um, we were building out technology for insurance companies and financial advisors. And so and I was a financial advisor at the time. So one of the things I did was I said, I'm going to moonlight on RepPro. Basically, like, I'm going to be a financial advisor. I'm going to make sure I've got income coming in. And then I'm going to find a way to make RepPro work on the weekends, at night, on holidays, whatever it takes. And um, what happened was my, my day job, my, my financial advisory job actually led me to my first client. So um, when I was a financial advisor and also our first investor. So when I was a financial advisor, I had a, a distributor, a group that I worked with above me that kind of supported me in a lot of different ways. Um, and I went to them and I said, hey, I've got this great technology platform. I want to I want to disseminate it out to all of your financial advisors that you work with. And here's how it works. And here's the benefits. And they said no at first. Um, they said, like, we're, we're working on the, the same thing internally. And um, and like, we're just not we're not interested this time. Sounds great. Like, keep on going. Um, but I was a client of there, so they were they were actually pretty nice nice to me. Um, and then, like, I think, you know, I, I'll forget the timeline wrong. It was a long time ago now. But I think it was, like, six or seven months had gone by, maybe. And then they came back and checked in on us. And they were like, hey, how's that thing going? And we had made a ton of progress. We put our head down and just made a ton of progress. And they were stalled out on theirs. And so they abandoned the internal thing, and they went with us. And so then they decided to actually invest in the business and become our first customer, and the great thing about it was it was an enterprise customer. So it really was the thing that well, that was this like this great jumping off point for us as a business. So that was how it all went down. Yeah, that sounds good. And so the, the first client success is always, I guess, a game changer, you know. But scaling up from, from there also brings this this own set of strategies and challenges, I guess. So as RepPro like, started to grow, what key maybe strategies did you implement to scale the business? I mean, the ch most challenging thing with that business, I think, was twofold. There was like this chicken and egg issue. So we were, the idea was to be a universal application for financial advisors to fill out insurance forms. So like, it could be anyone from like um, American Equity or, or Allianz or Athene or Nationwide. These are all big insurance companies. But to go get those companies on your platform is a challenging thing when you don't have any users. And it's hard to get users when you don't have any carriers on insurance companies on the platform. So what we did was we actually tackled it from both sides. You know, how do you solve the chicken and egg? I mean, one, one way we did it was we actually just brought on the financial forms for free without talking to them about it, without, without charging them. We just brought the forms on and then we went and got advisors on the platform. And so then we started getting more and more critical mass, more and more advisors started submitting the forms through our platform to these carriers. And then we could go to the carriers and have conversations with them and say, hey, look, we've already got a thousand forms submitted through our platform. Let's talk about our broader partnership. Here's the pricing. Here's how the whole entire relationship works. So I'd say that was generally speaking um, the path forward for us. It was more of an organic approach. We'd go convince a user to jump on the system and then we'd use that momentum to then go try and convince the enterprise to come on board um, to the RepPro platform. 
and then at some point you decided to to sell sell your company, right? So yeah, selling a company that you've built from scratch is, I guess, sort of monumental decision, right? So how did yeah. it happen? Can you can you walk us through that process? You you simply received some email or something, or you you you, you were you know working on this uh, to get like a client for a business. So you know when we. Were when we ended up, I think selling is a hard thing as an entrepreneur. Uh, I think it's really important to not be too married to your business to the point when like you don't know when it makes sense to to kind of move on to the next thing. Um, a lot of people, I think, work on businesses far too long when they know they aren't going to work or it's not that they're not going to work. They just know they're not going to have the outcome that they want to have. Like they, they realize, let's say three or four or five years in, whatever that marker is, it's not 10 years. You know, let's say it's three years in, they realize they don't have the next Facebook on their hands, you know, and so... Sometimes it makes sense to take another at bat than it does to kind of continue to labor over the same thing that you've built. It's basically a really big version of the sunken cost fallacy, is what I would say. Um, and so for us, we had we had like a viable business. We were solving a real problem. We were the, the company was was charging clients and making money, um, but we knew we weren't growing at the rate that we wanted to grow at. Um, there were there were three other co-founders in that business. Um, a designer, a software engineer, and then another one, another individual on the business side. Um, so I had three co-founders in that business. Um, and they're all like, that was one of the things that I did the best actually at RepPro is we just had an outstanding team. All three of those guys are just have gone on to build awesome companies and are, are, are really, really high caliber people. Um, but I think it basically had become obvious that like we, again, we didn't have the next Facebook on our hands and, and we were solving a real problem, but it was like, all right, we're ready. We're all ready to move on and solve another problem. So, but we're going to stick to this until we find, like, you know, we 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 depart in the right way. You know, we find a good exit for. We had investors, so we want to make sure they had good outcomes. Um, we'd made a lot of commitments to a lot of people that we wanted to see through. So, even though I'd say, like, let's say two years before we ended up selling the business, we knew we wanted to. Um, we just needed to find the right way to position the business and get everything, all the ducks in the row. And so, you know, we went through a process. And ultimately, you know, even a current partner that I have at Signal today ended up buying the business called the Nexus. Um, so a Nexus is a subsidiary of Nationwide. They're, they're awesome folks over there, super innovative. And they they went on to go actually build that, build the business that we sold to them, um, build it up. And then they they actually sold it again um, to a company called Invest Cloud. Um, so ended up being, I think, a really good outcome for everybody. Um, honestly, even more than the financial outcome was the fact that like it set up it set up the entire signal biz signal advisor business it really was the thing that gave me the knowledge to do what we're doing today at signal and, and speaking about your knowledge that you gained how did your past experience um transform in this new venture a new company uh, that is called signal advisors what was the erica you know moment for us starting that this new business well, I think this is like, so one, what is Signal? Sig I talked about RepPro being a forums platform, making it easier to buy, easier to sell and buy insurance for financial advisors. Um, the way that I think about Signal is, um, you know, if you're not from the States, it's maybe a little harder to understand, but um, in, the, in the financial services world in the United States, um, there are companies that are called captives. So it's like, your financial advisors work, they're employed by the firm. Um, that's like, you know, Chase Bank, if you will, or Northwestern Mutual. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different big firms. A lot of the big brokerage houses, they employ their advisors. There's this whole other side of the, of the ecosystem where they're entrepreneurial financial advisors. So they don't work for any one company. They start their own business. They're like, they're the entrepreneurial financial advisor. So they've got to make all these, they got to do all the hiring decisions themselves. They got to do the marketing, build the website, you know, kind of like work on the, the marketing and, and sales processes. Um, and they got to build out all the technology, like all of this is on their, their shoulders. And so what we're doing is we've built a platform, the best platform to build an independent financial advisory business on top of almost think about it like the Shopify for financial advisors um, is the way to think about Signal. And so that's so we're helping them with a wide variety of things um, and we're empowering them through technology. And I would say we're really I would say the first technology oriented provider in the space. Most people are focusing on you know sales and marketing and education. 
as kind of like the key ways that they they bring new advisors into their ecosystem where we're leading with technology in a way that nobody else is. Okay. Okay. So you also help them with sales and marketing stuff, right? For We will. Yeah. I mean, like we help them with everything they need, like they're entrepreneurs and they need help with mm -hmm. a lot of different things to run their business. And so we're building entrepreneurs inside of our company, which is pretty cool. So like, you know, we work with financial advisors in California to, you know, Miami to Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter where it is. Um, you know, we're, we're helping them build their business. It could be, again, like we're literally building their websites for them, creating, you know, we, so we actually have a studio in Atlanta where we'll shoot, um, TV shows, um, mm -hmm. and radio shows. We'll produce them and we'll do deals with different syndicated networks across the country and place those ad spots, um, mm -hmm. for the advisor. We also have co-hosts that will, mm -hmm. you know, sit down with them and interview them on their, okay. on their advisory business on different strategies. So, yeah, I mean, it's really wide reaching, but all of it comes back to technology because you're uh, everything that we're doing is running out of this platform. Okay. Um, and so that anyways, that's the way to think about it. So in, do you provide a sort of uh, custom solution, for example, for website building services that you provide, or you have some templates that are uh, compliant or something like that? It depends on the client, you know, and what they're mm -hmm. looking for. I mean, some clients just need a template and it will get you just as far, you know, some mm -hmm. really have kind of like, robust um marketing drip strategies that they want to they want to build into their websites and so it just depends on the on on the use case and on the advisor but yeah it would it spans the spectrum mm -hmm. got it got yeah. it okay so um you know you know what, what they say the, the the first time entrepreneurs they focus on product the second time entrepreneurs they focus on distribution and the third time they, they they're focused on on their team right so Where's your focus with Signal Advisors at the moment? I mean, I definitely, I thought a lot of it distribution when we were starting this business. Um, the team is something, you know, it's interesting. I like, I definitely heard that saying quite a bit. I think the team kind of happens in some ways, you know, like meaning if you're a third time entrepreneur, you have a much deeper network than you had the first time around. I basically knew nobody professionally. <laughs> like it was just my friend. I was I was 19. So like the people that I knew were just my friends. Um, and so, but, you know, going at it, you know, kind of like when you're, I guess I was 29 um, when I first, I'm 33 now. So um, I, I think it's just that you have much more mature network when you do it the third time around. And certainly, you know, kind of like as you progress in your career, you just know more and more high caliber people and you make mental notes where you're like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but when I do something again, or when I have a need, I want to work with that person in some capacity. I think, you know, kind of in your, in your life, you come across people like that. And so I just made notes like that about certain people. And then over time, you know, kind of when it's time to do something that's in their domain of expertise, I just reach out to them. And a lot of times, you know, like, how do you recruit people? I think the best way to recruit people is not to recruit them at all. It's to have honest conversations about what you're doing. And if they're super excited about it, I mean, like, this is kind of like the, like the Huckleberry Finn thing, like get them to paint the fence. Like they'll ask you, you know, they'll be like, that sounds really interesting. Like, what about me for that position? So I think that to me is kind of like, the best way to approach it. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not the only trick up the sleeve, but I'd say that's the, that's like the one that I think most people, people are always like, how do you approach somebody about being a co-founder or something along those, like they have questions like that. I think the question is to like have a clear understanding of what you want to, uh, what you want to build, at least to some degree, and then like talk about it and find people who are interested in that thing. And then like that, those people are going to start to sell themselves. Um, so that's, anyways, that's my advice on that one. Okay. And speaking about recruitment and, and people, right. Uh, speaking about your team. So focusing on flexible work and taking care of your team is, is clearly important at signal advisors, basically what, what I saw, uh, from your website, from your yeah. vacancies that you have there. Can you tell us how like a balancing work and life along with offering remote work has helped your team's, you know, effectiveness and maybe happiness. I mean, I think it, it's definitely, so we're a remote company. We've got about a hundred and over a hundred people, um, at signal and I'm in Detroit, but we have people all across the country. Um, I think I gotta get the number. I, 
37 states probably. Um, we're, we're, we're all, all in the U S um, I think there are good things about being remote and there are bad things about being remote. And I think it's really important to be honest about the bad things in the interview process because people tend to, if you haven't worked remote before, I guess in a lot of ways, all of us have through COVID. Um, but I mean, if you haven't really done it, um, in, in like an environment where you had the choice where you could work remote or work in the office, I think people tend to think of remote as this utopia. Like, uh, like it's, it'll be so great, so much flexibility, it'd be a lot easier, I can do things on my own time. I, I think that um, it's actually, it's actually great if you're very mature in your, in your domain. Like if you don't need a lot of handholding, if you don't need, um, I mean, everyone is obviously hopefully continuing to learn, but if you really have like a solid understanding for the basics of the thing that you're doing, I think that remote can be very effective. Um, I think if you're like out of college or this is your like first or second gig, couple of years in, I think remote is actually a big disadvantage is what I would say. Um, and we try to overcome that in different ways. So I think the first thing is just kind of like realizing like reality, <laughs> like, like, let's like, let's like, let's not like look at, Oh, how, look how great this all is. Like there are downsides. Let's acknowledge the downsides and let's try to like really overcome those downsides in certain ways. Um, I think, the one good, really good thing about remote, um, specifically, I think in our space, is that we can, we don't have to hire people who, um, we hire people who have a lot of domain expertise because we understand that um, if if you are in a remote environment, it's hard to get that domain expertise. It, you can still get it, but it just takes some time to develop. And so we hire people, I think, with a lot of domain expertise because we're not hiring in a 30 minute radius from our office, you know, we're hiring from anywhere in the country. And so we can go get people who have, you know, five years, seven years, eight years of experience. I think when, um, you know, the nice thing is we do have an office, it, great, I mean, an amazing office in Detroit, um, where I think if somebody is more, let's say junior in their role, then we want to bring people in. And it might not be that they stay in Detroit, definitely, definitely not the case. Like we don't have anybody actually that's like, being relocated but maybe they just kind of a little bit more hands-on of an approach a little bit more kind of like hand holding on in the early days really kind of step by step onboarding really being thoughtful about how they join and enter into the company because um i think that that those early days especially joining you know kind of like a fast-paced company as a new team member a new employee you want to get wins early you want to find, you want to build a reputation inside the business that you're a person who just gets shit done. Um, and so I think like kind of finding those early wins is, is really important. So I know I kind of said a lot there, but um, in terms of making people feel like connected to the whole when they are remote, mm -hmm. um, you know, we do a lot of things. I think, you know, there's like, there's a couple ways to think about it. One is like individual on the manager level, like, and on the team level. And then like scaling all and then like departments and then like scaling up to the company. Yeah. Um, so kind of like breaking it down like that. I think like constant communication with with like your direct reports. So like I think you you got to do let's say weekly or or biweekly one on ones. Um, mm -hmm. I think you need a weekly meeting with that team. Um, we also have something called like our our coins, which are ten different principles that we believe embody our culture. I'll give you a couple examples. Like you know. Um, obsessed with finding a better way. The inches we need are all around us. Um, you know, another one is um, another one is uh, always raising our level of awareness. So there's just these, and we, they're actually solid coins. So the question is like, how do you make a remote culture tangible? Well, we actually like made something that you could hold. Um, and so we when we actually have a, a monthly meeting where different team members recognize each other for exhibiting these different qualities, these different isms is, is, uh, as we call them. And, uh, and then we give those out and then we actually send them to somebody, uh, to the person, the recipient, the one who won, and then they, they put them on their desk and they have like a coin rack and stand. And so, um, we, have, we have nine. Um, and the idea is just to kind of like, there's lots of good things that you could put on your culture. You know, like put like put on your, you know, like you see lots of companies have like cultural boards where they talk like mm -hmm. these are the top 10 things. You know, I think our ours are kind of like what happens is I think we started out with five. And then as we I have two co-founders in, in Signal. 
Um, and as so Kevin and Jake and as Kevin O'Hara and Jake Cohen. And, and as we started to build out this business, we recognized different things. I mean, another example would be, you know, like execution, um, you know, kind of the ideas, um, ideas are valued, execution is worshiped. And the idea there is like execution is more valuable than ideas. And, and so like, we really need to basically focus on execution um, as a, as a company. And we noticed that we noticed we were maybe lacking a little bit in execution. And so we said like, all right, now we're going to, we have an all company meeting actually. And this kind of goes to the point that I was talking about earlier. We bring the whole company together for an annual meeting in Detroit. Um, and we, we kind of, we, we launched a new coin. We launched a new ism, um, mm -hmm. which was our executionism. And so that's when we start to recognize things that we need to get better at, we tend to make it a coin. Um, is, is one way that we do it. So there's lots of different things that I think you need to do, um, but those are a couple of them. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, be because I work a lot with with uh, fintech startups, I know exactly uh, how domain expertise is important for, for this niche specifically. Yeah. Uh, and cultural fit, yeah, 100%, 100% agree with you. It's super important. It's crucial for, I guess, not only for tech, for fintech companies, but for any companies in the tech space specifically. But still, I, I just need to ask, to ask this and just to uh, want to hear your opinion on this. Uh, how do you feel about hiring people uh, outside of the US? Is it something you're considering for the future? Maybe not for now, but maybe for like next year or something? I think so. I think, um, yeah, we definitely would consider it. Um, we haven't in the past. I think that it depends on what it is, you know, like, um, like operationally. Oh, so you, you tried, you tried and it didn't go well. Yeah. Um, we haven't, I think we've had, we've had, um, we have, we've had outsourced work done, um, overseas, but we haven't had any kind of like W2 employees, um, in that, that have been in other countries. But uh, I, I think on the operational side, so one of the things is like just time zone. Um, and so we have, there is a part of our business that is service. And so through that, those, those team members, those roles, I think are really challenging to do just with time zone constraints. But, but I would say like design, uh, product management, engineering, those are all things that I think are more um, reasonable um, to be done uh, not on the same, not in the same time zone. And so those, those would all be options. And we've, we've talked about it internally. And so, yeah, it's on the docket. It's not something we have like a, a real, like, you know, effort towards, um, but it's something we've, we've kind of like considered in the past. Okay. Got it. So probably my, my last question for, for those listeners who are maybe in, in sales, uh, and aspiring to become an, an entrepreneurs, right? What number one practical advice can you offer them based on your own experience? They're in sales and they want to become an entrepreneur. Exactly. I mean, I think the hardest thing about becoming, I mean, it depends on what kind of business you want to start. If it's a technology business, then you have to have a CTO and that's the number one thing. And it's kind of like self-selecting, I think from a venture capital perspective, it's like, if you are a venture capitalist and you're looking to fund a business and you're, you're an entrepreneur looking to get funding, um, I'd say the first test is like, have you recruited a good technical co-founder? Um, and if you can recruit, and if you're a good salesperson, then sell the technical co-founder on why they should leave their gig and come work with you. And so I think that sometimes that's a frustrating answer because it's something that people really struggle with. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of ways, there's so many other challenges that are gonna be so much harder than that that you're gonna face that it is like, it is just a prerequisite. And so if you're like sitting there thinking, I remember thinking this, like all I need is money. If I got money, then I get to hire an outside development shop. And then I could, I could basically tell them what direction to go. But you need, you need a CTO. You need kind of like a head of product. You need somebody who really is going to understand how to technically build out what you want to build. And so I'd say that's your first sales job is convincing a CTO to join you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think you've got a really viable shot. I think you got a really viable shot at doing whatever you want to do. Yeah. I, I guess that's, that's what you did. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I did both times. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's really what I did in, in, uh, in both cases, I would say, um, but like in, with rep pro, it was, I hired an outside firm and then I convinced it was a small shop, two person shop. We convinced uh -huh. that two person shop to become our co-founders in the business. Oh, it, was, okay. it was a, 
a software designer and a software move. engineer. Uh -huh. They they left their consulting gig and they became full time on RepPro. So they were co-founders at RepPro. And then on the other one, uh, started before we started the business. So Jake and I, Jake Cohen was was a venture capitalist at the time, and I had pitched Jake on RepPro, and he had said no. But Jake and I became friends, and so mm -hmm. over that period of time. Um, I was pitching him on this new, what became Signal. And he's like, hey, what if I leave the fund that we're part of and, um, and we have the fund invest? And, and then what if we actually, um, you know, kind of like start this company together? And I said, awesome. Um, but we needed, a, we needed a technical co-founder. So we knew, still knew that we like, we were missing a piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, but, we had, but by that time, we had such great, both Jake and I um, had such great, um, you know, kind of like networks that we were able yeah. to really hire a high caliber team. And so we went to, again, like talked about how, like, how do you recruit somebody? Like, just tell them about the thing that you're doing. And if they're really interested in it, they'll sell themselves. Um, Kevin O'Hara was, was at another technology business at the time. He, Jake had invested in one of Kevin's companies in the past. Jake introduced Kevin and I, we sat down for lunch, told him about what we're doing. Uh, Jake, I think met with him again. And then, you know, Kevin, left the company that he was at and started Signal with us. And so that was when we really had, you know, the real founding team to build this business. We actually had not all the components. We still needed to add stuff over time with different team members, but we had the base to build off of for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick, for sharing your insights. Uh, we wish you and Signal Advisors all the best in your journey. So keep, keep up the great work and take care. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed uh, the time here. And I hope that, you know, somebody somewhere just finds like some nugget that helps them take the step, because I think it's the most challenging thing that you'll probably ever do, but it's also the most rewarding. And, you know, I think when you're kind of like, this is an intense way to end, but I think when you're on your deathbed, you'll be happy that you did it. Yeah, 100%. That's true. Okay. Good luck.